Hello everyone. Today we're starting on a new section called the Rutherford Atom. It's the first module from, uh, from Quanta to Quarks. So uh, hopefully it'll give you a good sort of introduction, uh, idea of what the whole uh, module's about. So uh, the section is called the Rutherford Atom, which is one model of the atom. But before we can really get to it, we should probably understand a little about the history of the atom. So to start with, uh, we'll be learning about some of the ancient models of how matter works uh, and the ideas of Democritus and uh, Rutherford and J.J. Thompson and a few other folk. Uh, and in fact, one of the first ideas of uh, how atoms worked was that they were small indivisible particles, something like marbles, except really, really tiny. So, um, for a very long time, the matter of nature has been a topic of philosophical and not scientific debate. So many ancient philosophers have sort of pondered the nature of matter. We can see a statue of one of them over here. This is, in fact, uh, Democritus, a Greek philosopher. And he, uh, he proposed that what if all matter was made out of these tiny little sort of indivisible particles, kind of like marbles, but really, really tiny. And so what would you call something like that? Well, Democritus decided that he would call it the atom. Tom meaning cuttable and atom meaning uncuttable. So that can also be translated as indivisible. And he supposed this is sort of the smallest bit of matter it is possible to have. Other Greek philosophers like Aristotle uh, said, ah, oh, no, that can't be right because it doesn't really fit too well with our model. And uh, they, they suppose that all matter consisted of four different elements, which we can see over here. And so these elements were usually earth, fire, air, and water. And we can see on this little chart over here that uh, some of them have sort of similar properties. For example, fire and earth are both dry. If I can find a pen that works. <laughs> fire and earth are both dry. Air and water are both fluid or wet. Earth and water are both cold. And fire and air are both hot and sort of flowing. And so you can see that the ancient model sort of was able to describe a few of the different forms of matter, which is why, of course, it was so popular. And in fact, it wasn't just uh, the ancient Greek philosophers who had this view of the different elements that the matter was made out of. So today, the four elements are known as the classical elements. But of course, other countries and other cultures had uh, a number of different uh, sort of variations on this. Some of the different cultures that had a set of elements were uh, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, uh, uh, the culture of Tibet, of course, uh, it was also known in China and Japan. And here we can see a picture of the sort of five phases uh, of ancient China. We have at the top wood, and then going around, fire, earth, metal, and water. You can see that they all have different relations with one another. So wood feeds fire, fire produces earth, that's ash. Uh, earth bears metal, metal carries water, water feeds wood, and so on. So the idea of the classical elements sort of was the main idea of how matter works for a very long time. Uh, and this fellow here is the one who changed things. So in 1803, the turn of the 19th century, uh, a Scotsman named John Dalton uh, proposed an alternative model that wasn't sort of based on the four classical elements. So his system was sort of based on the reactions of different gases with each other that he had been experimenting on and sort of combines uh, parts of both the elemental view of the universe and the atomic view of the universe. So Dalton proposed that gases were made up of indivisible atoms. And he used the same word as Democritus, so indivisible, uncuttable. And the atoms of different gases were of different types, uh, and the type depended on the gas. So we can see at the top of this chart that he made, there are you know, about 20 different circles with different symbols on them, and these are the different elements of gas that he had identified. And he uh, also thought that different uh, sorts of atoms and different elements 
could join together to produce compounds. And we can see some of those uh, in the middle and at the bottom uh, of his uh, working out. So in the middle we have uh, sort of binary compounds which are joined of two different atoms. Then we have ternary which are three different atoms in a compound. Then a quaternary and um, a few others. And not all of these are completely correct. Some of them uh, were correct and in fact we still use that sort of model today when we're describing gases. But this isn't the whole story. So in 1904 cathode rays uh, which of course we've learned about in Ideas to Implementation, uh, were dis discovered to consist of negatively charged particles called electrons. So, J.J. Uh, Thompson of course was the discoverer. And electrons were smaller than atoms and they came out of atoms. So J.J. Thompson sort of had to figure out a way to explain this in terms of the model. The model at that point was that atoms were completely indivisible and that they were sort of a single unit. But the fact that electrons were smaller than atoms and came out of atoms sort of suggested something quite different. And this led to the idea that atoms consisted of smaller parts, parts that were subatomic, and it sort of makes the term atom, indivisible, a little bit misleading. So the discovery of uh, the electrons led to a refinement of Dalton's model. So that's sort of the base that this model is building on. As we can see, uh, the proposition of J.J. Thompson is that the electrons were sort of embedded inside the atom. So this is sometimes called the plum pudding model because you can say that the electrons inside the atom are a little like plums in a plum pudding. We can see that it's being sort of all held together in a big sort of sphere of positive paste. It sort of sticks them all together. And so you can imagine that uh, under the right circumstances you'd be able to get these electrons sort of coming out of the atom and creating cathode rays. And that's how J.J. Thompson explained it, but it's still not quite accurate. So in the early 1900s, the study of atoms and sort of how they're made up in their structure was an active area of research. And so a lot of progress was done uh, on sort of discovering the structure at this time. So theories formulated by uh, Ernest Rutherford, Max Planck, and Niels Bohr uh, resulted in many, many changes to the atomic model. And eventually we end up with something close to our model now. We can see uh, Rutherford on the left and Bohr on the right over here. So these models would eventually lead to our current model of the atom, which of course is quite different to uh, the original models that these scientists proposed and very different to the historical models of uh, John Dalton and the classical elements. Well, that's the end of the theory. So we've covered some of the history of atoms and of elements in this section. Uh, let's just go on to some questions to make sure you've got it all down. Question one. Ancient Greek philosophers believed that all matter consisted of a small number of elements called the classical elements. What are these four elements? We have a few options here and some of them look pretty familiar. Uh, so let's go through them. Part A, earth, fire, metal, water, and wood. These aren't the Greek classical elements. Uh, they're the Chinese Wu Xing, which is uh, the five movements. So they do describe sort of a set of elements, but they're more sort of a mnemonic or a cycle than the classical elements of Greek philosophy. All right, the second one looks, pr looks pretty familiar as well. Solid, liquid, and gas. These are the phases of matter that we use in chemistry and physics today. And in some ways, they're similar to the classical elements. The classical elements were used to describe sort of different states of matter, uh, just as solid, liquid, and gas are. So you could say that the solid is earth, the liquid is water, and the gas is air. You'd also have to have some sort of way to describe fire, but that's not really covered by this. So these are not the classical Greek elements, but they sort of have the same feeling. In fact, the correct Greek elements are option C, earth, air, fire, and water. And these are the four classical elements. Uh, using these, just like using our states of matter, the ancient Greeks could describe many, many different forms of matter by saying that they consisted of various parts of these four elements. Question two, which event led J.J. Thompson to develop his plum pudding model of the atom? 
uh, we have a few options here, but to answer this we need to sort of think about what the experiment did. The experiment produced cathode rays, so it can't be the discovery of cathode rays because those are already known when J.J. Thompson was doing his experiment. Uh, cathode rays came out of metal and they were known to be particles and not electromagnetic radiation. That's the big discovery that Thompson made. So if there are particles coming out of the atom, it means that the atom is not indivisible. And so that would require you to make a new model. And so of these four options, the discovery of electrons, neutrons, cathode rays, and atoms, we can see that uh, the discovery of particles that came out of the atom, which of course were electrons, were the thing that spurred Thompson on to make his new model. So A, the discovery of electrons, is the correct answer. Question three, outline the key features of John Dalton's model of the atom. Now it says features here, so we can't just name one. So let's think about the model a bit. It's the one that had lots of indivisible atoms that made up gases, right? So we say that Dalton suggests that there are many different types of atom. These atoms describe different gases. Elements are made up of all the same type of atom. So if you had nitrogen gas, it would be made up of lots and lots of nitrogen atoms and not, for example, a mixture of nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. And there must be some other feature we can name. Oh, I've got one. Compounds, like nitric oxide, for example, consist of different types of atoms joining together. This is sort of a feature of Dalton's model that was different to the original atomic model but sort of retains elements of the elemental model that said that different elements could join together. And of course he was able to create this model due to his experiments with joining different gases together. Question 4. Explain how Thompson's atomic model differs from Democritus's atomic model. Now let's just quickly think about those two models. Democritus's atomic model was the first model to sort of uh, use atoms, a small sort of indivisible unit, and presumably there would be just a sort of single indivisible blob of matter. Thompson's atomic model, on the other hand, had to factor in for electrons, which were newly discovered when he created it. So let's start off by writing a quick outline of where we're starting. Democritus's idea of the atom was that matter consisted of units tiny enough to be completely indivisible and uncuttable. So now we need to explain how it differs. We can say that J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom uh, suggests that the atoms consist of subatomic parts. So in this case it would be electrons and a sort of uh, positively charged sphere. It has to be positively charged because the overall atom is neutral. So in Thompson's model there are objects smaller than an atom and the atom is not completely indivisible. Question 5. In Dalton's theory of the atom, what is the difference between an element and a compound? And of course, if you do chemistry, you'll know that this uh, distinction is still used today. So the difference is uh, basically that an element consists of one type and a compound consists of more than one type of atom. So Dalton suggests that a pure element consists of a single type of atom. So he suggests that oxygen gas contains lots and lots of oxygen atoms. In fact, we know now that it uh, consists of pairs of oxygen atoms called molecules. But we don't need to go into that right now. So he suggests that two or more different elements can join together, like an atom of oxygen and an atom of nitrogen, to form compounds which have more than one type of atom in them. And so the atoms in a compound are joined together with the other types in simple ratios. So it means rather than having, you know, 127 to 129 as the ratio, it's more likely that they're joined in a sort of one-to-one -one ratio. Well, that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've gone through some of the older atomic models, including Democritus's model, and some of the models of classical elements. And we've gone through uh, the John Dalton model that sort of combined the two. And finally, the J.J. Uh, Thompson model which suggests that there are subatomic particles that make up the atom.